preparing the stream live on Facebook. Hello, Facebook. Hello, Facebook. Hello, Facebook. Facebook's Hello. kind of the behind behind the scenes view. Live on Facebook. Hopefully, it's on the right page. Yes, it's on the right page. Hooray. That's usually my other thing. All right. Heading on out here. It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons. Presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. Use the question panel on the webinar to submit your questions. Or you can hop on Twitter. Submit your questions with hashtag event icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Com. Now, without any further delay, this is Hashtag Event Icons. Well, hello. This is very exciting for me because this is a milestone episode. It's a 100th episode. So we're really, really happy to have uh, Jeff Duncan and Nadine with us today. And we're going to talk about housing. So core elements, so many meetings and events. One that remains a pain point for many planners, especially in this age of attrition, um, the realities of room pirating, alternate solution providers that denigrate our all important room blocks, so much going on. Um, it's so important because that room block ties into so much into the core of our meetings, um, looking at um, our, you know, our availability of our desired hotels, our preferred destinations, the right dates, affecting our overall space use, our meeting costs, just there's so much that goes into housing. But also the way we funded much of our meeting planner costs has come from using commission from contracted blocks as the funding to pay for that staff and technology to manage the housing process. Um, and this week, of course, this is our most topical week ever because with the cut in commission announced this week by Marriott Hotels, it's really just raised this issue to the forefront of what we're doing. So, you know, North America, they said, you know, March 31st, they're going from 10% to 7%. So almost not quite, but almost across the board, it's naturally created a bit of an edginess and a lot of discussion in our community. So we are going to talk about this today. How are the change responding? All kinds of things going on. So Jeff, hello, Brant. First of all, Brant, our other co-host today. <laughs> I'm here, host well, number one, Brant Kruger, host number two. And hi. right below there is Jeff Duncan. So Jeff is the CEO of Meeting Max, a company that has won awards for their amazing culture. They have a team that not only really understands event housing, but what they really, how they approach it is that it's just, it's the bedrock of technology, but also that it has to be a human experience um, and how housing helps us build a tribe. So some really interesting conversation around that. We're going to talk about that too. Nadine, I'm not going to say your last name because I will get it slightly wrong. <laughs> um, so you can tell us is the operations manager at A Triple One Power of Conference Services, in, which is a Vancouver-based conference and event planning company, uh, also an office in Switzerland. They specialize in customized services for conference hotel accommodation locally and internationally. So let's just get this out of the way. First off, how do we say your last name? <laughs> Spetalo. <laughs> <laughs> Can we spell so, that one phonetically, please? <laughs> yes, that is how we say it in Switzerland. It's perfect. Um, all right, so let's start a little with a little bit about each of you before we get into the meat of the day. So um, let's start with Jeff. What got you into the events industry? Well, first of all, I'd like to preface this conversation with the fact that Duncan is a much easier last name to pronounce. <laughs> and I, I noticed that you didn't stumble on that one. No, two <laughs> syllables. I'm all good. <laughs> um, the events industry, we, we actually, uh, my, my start was in the travel agency business. And uh, I was actually the vice president of uh, sales for Uniglobe Network Travel up until about 2002. And so uh, I saw and identified an opportunity uh, inside of kind of the travel space, but outside of the travel agency space on the whole idea of event production, uh, logistics planning, and all that goes into it uh, from, um, you know, accommodation management to uh, actual on-site logistics, meeting room management, speaker management, that type of thing. Uh, we got really good in the space of the accommodation management side and just decided to focus solely in that space. And uh, over the course of time, we uh, managed to uh, uh, grow in that business, 
uh, to the point where we actually needed to figure out some software uh, to be able to handle all the reservations that we were having for our own events. Um, that, fast forward to today, uh, has uh, transpired into its own software as a service business, uh, whereby organizations uh, will license the Meeting Max housing platform in order to manage all of their room blocks for all of their events. Um, and we're currently using it and we're quite happy. I'd like to thank you for that. So. <laughs> Fantastic, good to hear. <laughs> right? Nadine, what about you? What got you into this crazy industry? I started out with Congrex. It's a group at the, that went bankrupt a few years ago in Europe. I was starting in registrations and then I moved to accommodation. And then from there, when I transferred to Vancouver and we opened up our own company, it's just been continuously growing. And I really enjoy the housing part because it's so diverse. You have all these different partners that you work together with. You work with the hotels, you work with groups, you have the client from the project and you have individual delegates. So it's much more diverse than registration. It's, it's, it's different, has a different flavor to it. That I love. I I want I want someone like you everywhere that I work. <laughs> so, it really embraces either registration or accommodation, the core of what we do. So um, oh, So Nadine, if you weren't in the events industry, what would you be doing? What I'm doing? If Everything. You were... <laughs> if I weren't, if, if I weren't, you weren't working in the events industry, I really have no idea. I never knew what I wanted. I was always, yep. when I was a younger, a teenager in Switzerland, I thought, okay, I'm going to go to the States as a year as a pair. And when I'm done with this, I know what I want. And then, of course, you don't. And then I thought, I'm going <laughs> to go to France and I learned French. And then I will know what I want. And then I didn't. And then I went to the Netherlands to do a <laughs> multimedia design course. And I thought, now I know what I want, only to find out that HTML coding, not my thing. Yes, and then it's just now I'm here, so I don't really know what I would do otherwise. Well, this seems to be working out, so I'd stick with it. Yeah. Um, Jeff, what about you? What you would know, you know, I, I am torn on this uh, question, Tahira, because I feel like if I wasn't in the accommodation management space and the software as a service space related to accommodation management, I would probably be a hotel inspector. That, I think, would be the perfect role for me. And then I'm on the fence because I also feel like you know, I've got maybe a, a missed calling to be a, an EDM DJ. That would be, uh, that would be my next choice. <laughs> nice. You know, I don't know. Somehow I saw that one coming. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I, I, felt like, I felt like it was going to be there. I uh, love um, it. So now EDM DJ, sexy. Housing, less sexy. So, you know, you talked a little bit about what led you into a company. But I think that for me, what's actually really interesting about what you've done um, is that you took something that really is a fundamental core thing that all events need. You really focused on it. But what you've done is taken something that is, again, sort of that not super, you know, it's like technology, but you've created a very interesting culture. And I would really like to, before, again, before we just get into this, you know, this, all this commission stuff, I would like you to tell me some of the things that have driven you um, to build that culture and maybe a couple of highlights. Sure. Uh, fair enough. I think, uh, first of all, I think as an organization, uh, we got fairly good at determining what our core purpose was. Uh, so as an organization to know what it is that we are doing in this world, like what is our purpose? What, what, are, what are we providing to the world? And uh, getting an understanding the fact that Meeting Max, we realized that we're this idea about the need to commune. And I think everyone on this, uh, on this podcast probably, you know, who revolves in the event space in one way, shape or form, can kind of resonate with the fact that as human beings, we need to gather, we need to get together uh, and we need to do it in person. And when we gather is as a group, we kind of have the sense of community. And when we build this sense of community, it gives us almost a, a bit of a purpose. It gives us a sense of belonging as, as individuals. So Meeting Max realized, you know, it's, it's not our events uh, because uh, oftentimes they're, they're not our events. We're, we're, we're supporting events that are happening across the world. But what it is, is that the realization that we're there to foster this human need to gather and belong. And our core purpose as a, as a company are really helping people find their tribes. Uh, the idea that people have a lot of different tribes. Uh, you have a tribe, which is, you know, your family. You've got a tribe because you are, you know, a, a parent of a, 
of a sporting you know child you have uh, uh, groups that you commune with and get together and those are all different tribes and meeting max's realization is just we're here to help people find their tribes um, and I think starting with the purpose and understanding what we wh what we are and what we provide to to the world from there then identifying what our core values are and as a company we got very ironclad on what our core values were and I think it's a really long answer to your super short question but I think starting with the the umbrella of understanding our purpose and understanding our values and then everything's flowed out from there we've had an opportunity then to build an amazing culture and really finding people who resonate with our core values finding individuals who really feel like they found their tribe when they come work for meeting max and that's been super important for us uh, as we've continued to grow and build the, the amazing culture that you talk about Thank you, Brant. Yeah, well, Nadine, I'm just kind of wondering at what point in the process uh, do you find that people are typically coming to you, uh, ha having them help you manage the hotels? Or at what point in the process do you go to uh, you know, somebody else and help manage the hotels? Well, that's a, it's an interesting question because often I find hotels come as an afterthought. It's like, okay, mm -hmm. where do we want to have the meeting? Which venue do we want to have it at? And they organize, you organize your basic logistics for that. And then, oh, we need hotels. We need to sleep somewhere. Where actually it'd be really good if that was taken into consideration before you lock down on your location, because then you have a better vantage point to negotiate with the hotels. Especially if you are in a location where you take a couple of hotels that are nearby. Before you choose the location, you have somewhat of a, of a leverage to negotiate with the hotels because you haven't set yet on the destination but once you're set and you've decided then then you go to the hotels it's like take it or leave it like this is you know your delegates have to sleep somewhere so the earlier we can be part of the decision and support the housing the better actually and, and it was kind of part of your introduction you talked about you guys doing customized services um so uh, what does that mean in the context of your company so how are you customizing the hotel accommodations for your clients it's uh, important to understand also what kind of obviously what kind of contract is it is and then look at sure. what hotels that are around are going to be a good fit for that what is the price range that they can pay. Some conferences have a higher budget. The delegates who come, they want to stay in really nice hotels. And that's great for me working on commission. And then I've done other conferences where it was, you know, below a hundred dollars, 60 euros rooms a night, because that was the budget of the delegates. So you really try to work with the hotels. For larger events, what we have done is that we do a housing meeting with the hotels, with the GMs and all the people hopefully come that are part of the decision process of offering rates to present the pro conference to them so they understand who is coming and what is necessary because not every medical conference has a medical budget. Some conferences may sound like people have money and actually it's more of a budget conference. So Nadine, I'll ask you this and then maybe, maybe um, Def, you can pipe in as well. Um, you know, do you find that people are actually paying attention to the goals of the meetings or is that something that you're kind of struggling with, you know, trying to help them find, you know, are they paying attention to how the housing affects or is related to the goals of the meeting? Does that kind of make sense? You mean the clients who put the meetings on, the association? Yeah, the yeah. Are they, are, so are they, are they paying attention to the goals of the meeting or are you kind of having to help them out with that? And the, and the fit, I think, between the, you know, that the destination hotel and goals, or like yeah. you said, sometimes it's an afterthought. I think for many, often it's an afterthought. It's like, oh, I've decided on the destination. And then afterwards, they're like, oh, we need hotel rooms. We had this one project we worked on with them in Tokyo. And they had decided on the location already when we joined them for the housing. And they were before they had a conference in Northern Europe and Northern Europe is, is pricey, like Norway and Sweden, those are economically expensive countries. And they were saying, well, that was really expensive for the hotel. So we're hoping that Tokyo is going to be cheaper, but <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's not true because these hubs, these Asian hubs, they're really expensive too. So they didn't have any concept of that before they locked in on their destination. So I find often it's an afterthought, unfortunately. Is that answering your question? That's part of it for sure. And then I think, you know, to you, Jeff, you know, it's, 
I think that, you know, when you think about building tribes, you know, and take that into a, a association hotel perspective, how can you then use hotels to help them meet some of those goals of building community? For sure. I, well, I think it comes down to uh, location of the hotels. For example, if you've got uh, if close proximity is important. Um, the idea that this group of people that are convening together, uh, that are all part of this, uh, the, the overall conference tribe, understanding that there's actually a sub tribe associated with that. When you are at the headquarter hotel, well, that adds to this level of uh, or idea of tribe. You've got uh, now a tribe within a tribe. Um, so the, the proximity plays a big uh, uh, and warrants a large uh, 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 overall perspective. It, you've got some properties that are shuttle route, uh, uh, you know, via, via buses that, uh, that you need to, uh, uh, to bus and shuttle back and forth. That's the same idea, that, that, that idea of that you are fostering a separate tribe. Each one of those hotels should be working to um, build together its tribe. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I just recently at, at PCMA, um, down in uh, Nashville, which I'm sure many folks were at, there was uh, in the hotel of the Sheraton, there was a uh, representative from the Sheraton right in the hotel. And there were PCME members to welcome and greet and provide a little bag of you know, goodies and, and uh, bottled water and welcome them back to the hotel. That's the idea of that kind of fostering the tribe, that they all know that you're there for PCMA. The reality is, is that they are um, also staying as part of your tribe as, as the Sheraton Nashville Hotel. So I think that, that, that was a kind of a neat initiative uh, uh, to be able to undertake. Yeah, I think that's one of the things um, that I have particularly have seen PCMA do well is to really take those hotel partners at their events and really get them engaged in, in being able to meet those planners and people who are there and really and build on that and, and build that idea of that connectivity, which I think is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, this can, we'll start with you, Nadine. I'm interested if you've seen this at all. So we have um, uh, Patty, Patty Shock. Thank you for joining us. Um, so Kanji is, Kanji's asking the question um, around Airbnb. So, you know, of course, that's another slightly related to what we're talking about today. But, um, you know, are you seeing that where you're losing any hotel room, room block guests that you would typically expect to have to Airbnb? Um, when you're planning your meetings, Nadine? It's difficult to say where they go. I would actually love if, as an organizer, when you put out your survey for the conference, you include a section on housing where you ask, you know, did you, where did you, did you book within our blocks? And if yes, you know, how did you like this? But then also, if not, where did you book and why? So you get an idea of why those people book outside of your blocks. And some things might be really easy for you to customize to meet their needs so they can book next time the book within your blocks. So since we don't, aren't able to pull these reports from people who not book with us, it's really difficult to say where they book. And I also think it depends on the size of the conference and how far out people are. I would myself certainly consider booking something on Airbnb to be close if all that's left in the housing block is 45 minutes traveling with a bus. Whereas, like Jeff yeah. pointed out, if um, the headquarter hotel nearby or if there is the hotels that are close by, then I would prefer to stay with my fellow conference delegates in the same hotel. Yeah, and I'm kind of with you, Nadine, on that. You know, the, 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 I guess the, the idea that proximity will never be disrupted, having the convenience factor of taking the elevator out of, you know, the, the conference straight to your room. Um, really, Airbnb is not going to disrupt that side. Where we're seeing some disruption from Airbnb are, as you stated, those peripheral properties that may be further away. It's interesting because you've got um, both hotels that have concern about Airbnb and the business that they might be taking from them. And you've got the conference organizers and those that could be potentially receiving commissions for uh, the booking of the rooms also concerned. Uh, it, it's, it's fascinating to take a look at a number of events that really cannot thrive without Airbnb. Uh, and kind of taking that other stance and looking at, uh, at, at events that take place that have um, a scarcity, you know, in terms of uh, quantity of rooms. You look at organizations like or events like South by Southwest or Oracle Open World, or you look at some of the, the larger programs, especially in North America, that if it weren't for Airbnb, these events couldn't thrive as they're thriving. They indeed have the ability to have the attendance and, and attain the attendance. Uh, due to the fact that there is additional lodging available. 
when you've got every last room being consumed uh, in the city by an event, uh, the, the, really the event can only grow uh, to the magnitude that the city can hold it. And by having uh, an increased inventory of rooms uh, via Airbnb, that actually increases the overall, uh, the, the overall attendance count, which counteractively uh, puts pressure on, uh, on, the, on the room rates and uh, allows the hotels to actually increase their room rates due to the fact that attendance is up. So interesting uh, dichotomy there as far as uh, uh, how hotels and, and event planners uh, view Airbnb. Well, and I think, you know, to kind of like bring this back sort of full circle to what we started out talking, or we said we would talk about, so Airbnb, of course, no commissions. And Nadine, you said a few minutes ago, you know, that you're happy when people want to go into those higher hotels, the, the higher priced hotels, because they are on commission. And so now, you know, we have the reality is for most, for many people, and actually there is a, um, Joan Eisenstadt wrote a great blog post about all of the reasons that she hasn't taken commissions on hotel rooms for, or for the work that she does. Um, one completely valid viewpoint. Um, but for many, many, many companies in the industry, you know, they're, they are using that commission to offset some of those labor costs so that the client isn't feeling the hit of what it actually takes to manage your rooming list. Um, so now when you start to look at that reduction in commissions, you know, what does this mean? You know, and that also well, that they chose, you know, was there some kind of reduction in commission somewhere? Cause I hadn't read about <laughs> it. In any industry what? magazine. No, article. no, yeah. no. <laughs> no. Yeah. So, you were buried Twitter you know, stream uh, this oh, last yeah. week, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Something I'm working. About, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to work on the assumption that anybody listening to the show today is aware <laughs> that last week Marriott said that in North America, U S and Canada, they will be cutting the commissions after for contracts signed after March 31st from 10% to 7%. And then they exempted four specific companies. So that, you know, it's all a little bit craziness, but you know, so what does this mean? So, you know, for agencies like Jeff and Nadine, what does this mean for you guys? So uh, you, either one of you can take it. Nadine, you want to kick it off? Well, yeah, so what we do in the particularities that how we have been operating so far is that we actually, we sell the rooms and we take in all the money from the delegates and then we pay the hotel and when the delegate arrives, they only pay on checkout any extras, which allows me to actually recalculate the room rate so I get 10% commission, which would, depending on how you see it, would can be considered as a markup, but so that I can buffer these 10% and then share the commission, how it's shared within the clients, and you have the credit card fees go off. So if you rely on 7% commission, it's actually very small. And then there's also chains in Europe that have been doing this already, like the awkward chain, depending on, on the stars, they have already had that four star hotels had 8% commission and lesser stars hotels, like some of the IBIS properties have 5% commission and some hotels don't give any commission. We've had a project in Paris last year where we had to add the 10% commission into the sales rate because there is the agreement with the client to share the commission with them and I can't share something I'm not getting. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah. Jeff, what are your clients seeing? Yeah, well, it's, obviously it's all uh, very early uh, and uh, we've been kind of making sure that we're keeping our finger on the pulse of, of what our customers are thinking, uh, how they're feeling about it, and as well some, um, I guess, looking around the corners and trying to figure out what they're going to do about it. Um, I've seen, and, and I think uh, Nadine's uh, position is, is really interesting and, and potentially of the future of where planners are going to need to go as far as bundling together uh, accommodation, uh, with packages associated with uh, registration and accommodation and other peripheral um, um, services. Uh, we're seeing also organizations that are uh, traditionally collecting rebates. Uh, and maybe those rebates are, you know, to offset ex expenses, maybe those uh, rebates are associated with uh, uh, receiving or, or allowing or providing some housing related services. Um, and so, honestly, we're, we're, we're seeing customers who say, okay, if you're going to take 30% of our, of our known revenue away, we're going to have to supplement it with something. And increasing uh, rebates on that side or introducing rebates is, is certainly a way um, that people are looking uh, to, to try to counteract it. I guess at the end of the day, it's, it really is 
uh, anyone's guess as to where the other hotels are going with this. I mean, we've seen uh, over the course of the last week, we've seen some of the smaller chains uh, take this as a, 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 a competitive advantage. We're even seeing, you know, Wyndham Hotels comes out as the superstars to say, guess what, people, we're not changing commissions. And somehow by, you know, 10% being table stakes last week or the week before is now, some, you know, some above and beyond. Um, but on the above and beyond, you've got preferred hotels of the world that are coming forward and saying, hey, we're going to be paying 11% commission for groups through 2018. And even uh, like the Eden Rock Miami, Nobu Hotel Miami and Nobu Hotel Los Cabos are coming forward and saying, we're going to give you 12% commission uh, for any groups in the short term. So I guess those are all kind of the smaller um, properties or the smaller chains that can use this as a competitive advantage. I guess the big question is, what are the bigger guys going to do? Uh, what's Hilton's position on this? Uh, what's IHG going to do on this? And those are where we're kind of sitting on the sidelines saying, you know, if I were, if I were Hilton, I don't have any sort of rationale to do anything about it at the moment. Status quo, I'm paying my 10% commission. Let's just see how our group business might be affected over the course of the next, you know, three to six months. Uh, if our group business has increased dramatically, maybe it makes sense to hang tight and keep with it. Uh, if, uh, if we don't see any effect, then why not just join Marriott and go down to 7%? Or how about going to 8% and saying, hey, we give you 1% more? So I, I don't know. It's, it's fascinating to watch, and it'll be interesting to see how it rolls out over the next year. So we've got a question that came in from the audience. We just want to remind anyone that's joining us live uh, via Zoom that you can use the Q&A panel or the chat panel to do that. So uh, Devin did just that. Devin Joyce is asking, uh, I think this is directed at you, Jeff, based on your earlier comments. You speak on vicinity being a priority. How are you handling events that are in different markets? In other words, sporting and entertainment that have multiple venues. So when you're trying to get people together with their tribe, how does that work, I think, when you've got multiple venues, if I'm understanding the question right? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question, especially with the large, I mean, sporting events uh, are, happen to be a, a big, a large percentage of, of the things that are on our, uh, on our housing platform. Um, and it does, when you've got an event like the World Police and Fire Games, who has potentially, you know, 100 different venues taking place, uh, as far as assembling people and making sure that they're uh, able to connect with their tribes, uh, and shameless plug here, but, you know, you backed me into this uh, and it's your own fault uh, for, for asking the question, uh, Devin, Brand. Devin backed you into it. Don't okay, so De De Devin will point the finger at you. But if you've got a housing system, if you've got a, a, a housing system that's being used to allow the attendees to be able to make their hotel reservations, of course, having a housing system that allows you to search from multiple points uh, or important points or, or locations where the event is taking place. Again, back to the World Police and Fire Games, if you've got you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of venues taking place, being able to say, hey, I want venues closest to my particular sport. Uh, and here are the uh, hotels in the various vicinities relative to my sport uh, would be important. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's how we would, uh, we would curb that particular aspect. Uh, Nadine, just uh, do you have any input on what, how you would deal with a multiple venue uh, situation like that? I haven't had myself where I've worked on a project with multiple venues, but yeah, I think Jeff's approach is good that you have a system where you can search on what you need and which venue you want to be close to. It, you know what, I think it's, it's now, I think maps are table stakes, right? So we want to be able to just be like, bang, what's close to me? And, you know, and really that's just become something that we sort of expect now in a platform. And, certainly other sort of non-traditional or, you know, non-conference platforms offer that, right? So sure. we do, you need to now sort of step up and do that. So obvious differences between kinds of programs. So, you know, what are you, what are you guys seeing as sort of trends, you know? So obviously I know Jeff, you guys do a lot of um, those multiple venues, you know, South by Southwest, World Police and Fire Games, a lot of concerts, hence probably your need to become an EDM DJ. That's right. Thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> What, what's your name going to be? That your DJ name? Think about that. We want well, to know. <laughs> no, no, D, G, DJ JD. I mean, it's perfect. I, I you know, <laughs> does it get any better than that? It's true, actually. <laughs> I'm so glad I asked. Um, okay, so um, Nadine, what are some of the things that you know the kinds of programs that you're working on? Um, what are the types of programs you're working on, and sort of the levels of hotels? Like, you know, is it incentive programs or conference programs? What are they? What are you seeing shifts in what they're looking for? Well, conference programs and 
I'm not sure the shifts in what they're looking for, but really more the shift that people decide later and later and later and later and later, whether or not they book and where they book and how they book. And that is making it difficult, of course. So ways to find ways to incentivize or encourage people to book earlier. And it was interesting. We were in Nice in November for a site visit and purchasing for other project next year. And one of the hotels told us that she sees people book on, let's say, booking.com. They book for a rate. And then a few weeks before they arrive or a few days before they arrive, if there is a better rate out, they cancel the reservation they did and they make a new reservation. So I think people are really becoming more and more budget conscious. And it might be interesting also to see if you can have like a flexible way of displaying rates. For example, if you have lots of inventory and it's far away, like with the flights, the price is cheap. And then the less inventory you have, maybe the rooms can become more expensive so that people are more encouraged to book oh. earlier when it's cheaper. Like your flexible rate mortgage on your hotel rooms. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be interesting. You know, it's interesting be nice. because from a hotel perspective, you know, they're doing daily RevPAR meetings. They're, you know, sitting down every day with their group and looking at every group at every different kind of platform that could book with them and saying, you know, what is going to be our mix for tonight, next week, next month, in six months. Um, and certainly, you know, groups aren't doing that. We're a little bit more ad hoc about it, I think, and a little bit less, you know, as you said, you see the people driven to choose a destination, announce it and have not booked a hotel, which just seems insane to me. But, you know, where am I going to put those 800 people? <laughs> but, you know, so, yeah, like what, how do we, how do we make that shift? And how do you, I love that idea of you know, flexible rate pricing. It's just like, it's actually just going to be more. So book now. I think, you know, we've seen some groups um, who have done, you know, your registration is more expensive. if You book outside of the room block and things like that. Those are difficult to enforce. So, you know, what are some of, you know, what are some things that you're seeing that are successful? Um, in helping to, to manage this. Is there anything that's working? Well, from our end, we're, we're seeing kind of the, I guess you first have to ask yourself, are you looking to provide an incentive or are you looking to provide a penalty? That's the very first question. Um, you see that there's, uh, you know, events that are taking place to say, hey, if you stay in the block, we will deduct a certain amount off your registration versus the idea of saying, if you don't stay in the block and we catch you, we're going to charge you extra. So that's the very first, that's the fundamental question. Are you gonna penalize or are you gonna incentivize? Uh, on the penalize side, you, you see uh, attendees uh, that are being forced into a, especially in the sporting world, the, the, the idea of a state of play to say, hey, if you wanna play in this particular event or tournament or what have you, you've gotta stay in the block. And, uh, you know, wow. if you don't, if you don't stay in the block, you're going to get booted out of uh, the tournament where your team can't play because it's been, you know, people have been caught who are staying outside of the block. That's the hardcore, um, you know, the, 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 the penalization. And if you want to get on the wrong side of the attendee, um, oftentimes that's the way to go. <laughs> uh, but, but, it, but it's fascinating to watch. And the fact that it's, it is very heavily adopted, especially in amateur sports, and especially in the, in the US uh, market. Um, whereas on the opposite side, you take the same idea, but turn it on its head and say, okay, well, what if, if you do stay in the block, there's gonna be some additional incentives to you. Uh, how about, um, you know, it, uh, only people who are staying in the block are entitled to X, Y, Z uh, keynote uh, speech, or, or uh, they're entitled to this particular package, or, you know, gifts in the room are only going to people who are inside the block. Um, well, that know, happens anyhow. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Yes. Uh, or entered into a specific contest. You know, if, if you do stay in the block, everyone in the block is going to be, you know, entitled to be a, a part of this particular area. Um, but we certainly see um, as justification if, if organizations are implementing this state of play that they feel that they are able to adjust the rebates up to a point that goes beyond the rates that are available, the best available rates to the public. And again, if you want to get on the wrong side of the attendee, force them to stay in a block and force them to look at a rate uh, that is considerably higher than if they just went to the hotel's website directly or went through an Expedia or a Travelocity or what have you. Um, so there needs to be a shift in thinking there for sure. 
on moving more towards that incentivizing as opposed to uh, penalizing to stay on the good side of the attendee from my perspective. I think that's a really important point. And I'll be honest with you, even though I'm in this industry, I have booked outside the block, uh, even though I know that that's a hot button topic. And I'll be honest with you, it's because of, it was expensive to book inside the block. And so, you know, depending on how, and how you react to that, that, you know, I'll, if that conference that I'm in one that I'm particularly thinking of were to penalize me in some way for doing that, I don't know that I'd go to be Mm -hmm. perfectly honest. And so you have to weigh that in as well, that, you know, you, by, by either, either incentivizing or disincentivizing, there's a possibility you're going to lose people as well. Yeah. And I think that to your point, Brant, that, that, uh, you know, that, that rate side of things, it needs to go back to the planner at the very beginning stages of contracting with the hotel, the hotel uh, in the contracting process, as far as providing an incentive to the attendee, there should be some sort of low rate guarantee written into the contract. To say, hotel, I am willing to take, you know, X percentage of your overall inventory, but I want to make sure that I'm not getting my knees cut out from under me. Therefore, this is the rate I've agreed to take, you know, 50 or 60 percent of your hotel in the case of, uh, uh, of that particular situation. And I want to make sure that it's the lowest rate available uh, at any given time through any channel outside of maybe government or pre-negotiated corporate rate. And that is the first incentive. Obviously, if you're looking at uh, you know, a room that's $150 is being sold to you for you know, $195 through the block, well, that's your very first uh, you know, uh, out that you're going to take in order to, uh, to kind of skirt around the block to save money. Yeah. Uh, and who is not going to do that? Because whether you're traveling as an individual or on behalf of your corporation, there's always a pressure to not be... I don't know anybody that looks for the highest rate when they travel. Maybe you guys have different friends, but, <laughs> so, you know, I think that that, that is um, completely valid. Nadine, what are you seeing with, you know, this, this rate pressure? We have now a project where we try to incentivize. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. We have been trying this for a few years with another client we worked with, and they never wanted to do it because they were afraid that it would put people off from coming. Um, We do for sure ask the hotels in the contract to have that this is the lowest rate directly from the hotel on their website. And the other thing I would add to this, even if you have it, you may want to go and check every now and then on their website that they're not putting on a sale or whatever, which can really easily happen if the head office somewhere decides that we're going to sell this week, you know, half price or, pay three nights and stay four. We've had that with one property. And then that doesn't look good again to your delegate. So to also keep an eye on it, even if you did get an agreement from the hotel on that your rate is the best rate for the conference days, that it may still be that they slip below that offered price. Yeah, you, you have to mind that because, you know, it's, I'm certain that whoever's making those rev part decisions, you know, at eight o'clock in the morning in that meeting is not necessarily going back to read every contract <laughs> to see if they have that in it. Right. So mm-hmm. it's, it makes it challenging. Um, one of the other things that you said um, was that, you know, you're often, you know, obviously upfront with your clients and sharing that commission. Um, and I think that this is something that, you know, across the industry, everybody manages a little bit differently. And that of course becomes one of our biggest challenges is, you know, that really around the ethics of, of this idea of a commission. So everything in the world, everything has a retail price and a wholesale price. This is not like a new concept on any level of anything that is for sale. And a hotel room is as much of a commodity as anything else. Um, and certainly commissions are something that happen not just with hotel rooms, but happen widely. Um, my guess would be that there's probably a whole bunch of people in the world who are surprised to find out that there was commissions at all being paid to people um, so, <laughs> who are not, you know, necessarily in the industry. So, you know, and this is, might be something that Jeff may have a bit more of a handle on um, just from more clients um, doing different things. But do you guys feel like most clients understand that when they are working with us to book hotels, that those hotels have a commissionable rate and where those commissionable rates go and are comfortable with that? 
Well, I would say from, from my end, uh, the transparency is certainly there in that quite often the, the client is the one that's going to be signing uh, the contract for the, for, with that particular property. And uh, in that agreement, there would be a, a commissionable clause uh, stating yeah. that, you know, XYZ organization is, is the commissionable third party that's entitled yeah. to this uh, and kind of laying that out right in the contract yeah. side. So I, I would say that that, uh, that that kind of takes care of that level of transparency from the client's end. I think yeah. most clients look at it and say, listen, I don't have the resources. I don't have the know-how. Uh, you know, I'm in the business of X. I'm not in the business of throwing events. And I'm not in the business of understanding the complexities of, you know, what the rate should be. What are what are liabilities right now? And what are the trends we're seeing with this particular chain of hotels? And how much, uh, you know, uh, attrition, What you know, is 85% a legitimate attrition? Should it be 80%? I've seen 90 out there, you know, uh, I guess the, 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 the organization that uses the third party uh, to, to work with negotiate and contract uh, is usually there because they realize that that's not their business. And there's organizations and individuals that do this uh, on a full-time basis and understand all of those areas. And so I think that that tends to be that kind of core market of uh, companies and individuals that say, this is not my business and I don't want to be in this business. I want to be in the business of putting on this great event. I don't want to have to figure out all of those areas. Um, and I think that that, that that goes to show, you know, you've got a, a, a third party who's very good at what they do. Uh, and I would push back and say, yes, there is, you know, a retail and wholesale price to everything. But I would say that, you know, you go into, uh, uh, I, I definitely do not want to liken this to, to a car a lot. But, you know, you go in with someone who understands... <laughs> Yes, but you go into you know you go into a lot and uh, and understand what the wholesale value of this uh, of this car is. You get a understanding of what maybe factory incentives are coming down and uh, you know the right time to purchase and all of those kind of the science of uh, determining uh, how to how to put together a, a great hotel contract. Uh, you will allow you uh, uh, the ability to be able to write a better deal than just walking in off the street going, oh, hey, that car looks shiny and, and good. Let's let's go with that one. So that, that's where I'd push back. And there's no question that there's there, there are two different prices. But having someone in the ring who knows and does this or really is going to protect the essence of the third party, as long as, again, we can circle back onto making sure that that 30, uh, third party is actually being uh, compensated in one way, shape, or form, vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the other aspects that we talked about earlier. So well, I think, of, oh, go ahead. I was just, I mean, to that point, I'm just curious, I mean, is there kind of a low end to where it, you know, doesn't make sense to bring in a third party? So, I mean, for, for example, I plan literally one event that has 20 people uh, that stay at one hotel. So I've never thought about commissions. I've never, I mean, at be, I was like, you know, just kind of give me your best price and we go from there, you know? At that level, when you're talking about something that small, does it make sense to engage you guys, uh, either either you, Jeff, your, you know, using your software technology or going to someone who knows the ropes like you, Nadine? Nadine or, is there, is there a level, or is there a level yes. where it's like, no, it's not worth it? For me, for me, for me, it doesn't matter if it's 20 rooms or 2,000 rooms, the amount of like work, except that, of course, you speak with more hotels for 2,000 rooms. It's similar, setting it up and all. So I think if it's smaller, like in your case, it's perfectly fine to just, you have your venue, you have your hotel. Maybe now you can go and say, hey, can I have commission from these rooms? So maybe it supports some of your expenses or other fees that you incur with that what work that you offer, that you do. I think if it becomes more, if it becomes several hotels, especially in Europe, I know in the States, there's a lot of big hotels and you have your meeting in the hotel and all the rooms are in this hotel, but especially once you branch out and you deal with a number of hotels, three, four, five, six, sixteen, sixty, then certainly it becomes more valuable to bring a partner on board. And I would personally, I find as soon as it's more than one hotel, it's great to have a system like Medimax where you enter your dates and you see all the hotels that are available. And I don't have to go and look on each individual hotel link to see what they offer. So for me, I think as soon as it's more than one, two, three hotels, it's for sure worth looking into. Yeah, I think it's brand. It comes to, will be best. Sorry, yes, I'm thinking sorry. Now. Uh, just, uh, just <laughs> thinking that it, it comes down to economies of scale, right? You know, you've got uh, potentially 20 individuals coming in 
uh, for 20 rooms or 10 rooms if it's double occupancy. Just the overall uh, savings from using a third party would probably be you know, less significant because it's only multiplied by over 10 hotels or, or, or 20 hotel rooms. Uh, as far as our, our system's concerned, it tends to be organizations that are holding large programs, like Nadine mentioned, with uh, a, a large number of hotels, certainly more than one hotel. If it's a single hotel uh, event, then, you know, the most hotels can provide you some sort of link for groups to be able to book inside the block. Um, but at the point that you end up with more than one hotel property is the point that you don't want to be steering your attendees down, you know, potentially three or four, or 50 or 150 different paths for them to be able to book inside of your block. You want to reduce that barrier to entry and make it as easy as possible for the attendees uh, to be able to, uh, to, to book inside the block. So, yeah, there is a break point, I would think, uh, on when it makes sense to use a third party. It might come down to the third party. Smaller or individual meeting planners might say, hey, you know, your 20-room uh, uh, block uh, over a couple nights is, uh, is, is a value to me, and I'm, I'd like to be able to take that on. Um, but uh, in, in a lot of cases, you're going to need a little bit more um, numbers backing you in order to justify the use of it. Which makes sense, I think. Um, Nadine, can we just ask you, you know, you obviously have offices here and in Switzerland. So what are some of the key differences that you see between sort of the this men, you know, mentality of booking versus a European planner mentality in booking? So what's different, what's interesting in, in Europe is different. There's no attrition. There's oh. cancellation fees, but there's no attrition. Yeah. And so that, that makes it a little different with working with the hotels. There's often, there aren't these huge blocks that you have here. So often meetings are held in conference centers and then you use a number of hotels around the venue. And if it's a European meeting, then also people tend to book later than if it's an international meeting because also flights within Europe are cheaper than if you have to fly internationally. There are a lot of low cost um, airlines in Europe where you can fly for $100 return. So you don't have to book so early. Why are and, we in yeah. Europe? <laughs> Hey guys, I'm just curious, um, you know, as, as the person whose wheelhouse this is not, um, you know, I'm a technical guy, I'm dealing with lights and sound and things like that. But I also overheard this conversation and recently at a conference of meeting planners where someone was struggling with the definition of attrition. So since it came up, would one of you want to tackle kind of the layman's, this is what attrition is and how it works? Well, I'll take it on, on, on my end and I'm sure uh, Nadine's got some thoughts as well. The idea of attrition is uh, when you enter into an agreement with a hotel, you're agreeing that they're going to earmark a certain amount of rooms during a specific period of time, and they're going to hang on to them. They're going to take them off the shelf, and they're not going to sell them to anybody else. So the hotel says, listen, I will take this risk because you are willing to tell me that you're going to take these rooms, but I need some sort of assurance. I can't just give you the take these off the shelf and then just you know, cross my fingers and hope that you sell them. So the, the idea of, uh, uh, of, of, of an attrition policy is such to say the hotel would um, state that we expect you to use a certain percentage of these rooms. And in some cases, uh, is, especially in the United States, 80% attrition is kind of you know, standard. We see 85, 90%, we see as little as 70. And sometimes if you hear about a, a courtesy block, the idea of a courtesy block is saying, hey, we, we, we want a handful of rooms, but we're not willing to take liability, and there, therefore there may be no attrition policy on it. But the idea is if you don't uh, end up consuming the rooms that, uh, that you've contracted based on that certain percentage of the 80% or what have you, that you'd be liable to compensate the hotel for that lost revenue. I feel like that so covered it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you Good. commit to yeah. that percentage. Yeah. So it's and really in your interest to have your delegates pick up your rooms yes sure. and in europe they have to pick up the rooms because there's no attrition i didn't know that that's an interesting new thing i learned thank you mm -hmm. um all right so obviously this you know our industry changes so quickly so especially this week it feels like um what do, what do you guys what do you do nadine to keep current with what's going on out there is to keep going to your meeting planning events where you learn and exchange with other people about what is going on and what they are doing, share ideas and grow your, your view on what is going on and what is possible. I think so, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, you know, as an organization, we try to make sure that we've got feelers in a whole multitude of different uh, events that take place uh, from uh, specific industry events. You look at the MPI WECs and the, the PCMAs, uh, DMAI, which is the big convention of visitor bureau conference, uh, uh, being active at, at attending, you know, probably uh, uh, half a dozen to 10 shows annually as a company. And then from there, we, we have a user conference that, that Meeting Max hosts um, that just brings in, you know, housing related people that are, that are focused on uh, the, the logistics and operations around housing. Uh, but we're also talking about non-industry stuff. And I've been uh, very bullish on, on uh, making sure that as a company, we're looking around as many corners as possible, attending uh, Singularity University, for example, uh, which, uh, which takes place in, in San Francisco, their, uh, their annual summit, looking at all the emerging technologies, seeing what the latest and greatest is coming out, not just in our industry, uh, but uh, humanity as a whole. And that way we can stay, instead of the silo of here's what's going on in the event world, you can say here's what's going in, on in the world and here's how it uh, pertains and affects events. So important. Um, okay, so Jeff, tell us about this unconvention. Can anyone go? Uh, I've well, heard any, it's really cool. Yeah, the unconvention is uh, is is our annual user conference. And in, in answer to your question, can anyone go? I think the answer is yes. We've got a, a number of uh, individuals and organizations that uh, that come to the unconvention because there really is no other event on the planet that is solely <laughs> focused on housing. That's uh, that's something that doesn't exist. And so people in the world of housing and accommodation management find good value in the fact that, hey, when you're under a roof with a whole bunch of other people that all they think about and deal with is housing on a regular basis, uh, it allows for your return on investment fairly quickly. Um, so the, the unconvention is something that, that we host annually. Uh, we do it in Vancouver as a way to kind of um, open up and allow our clients into kind of our world and uh, give them an opportunity as well to, to check out a big chunk of Vancouver as we try to keep it as unconventional as possible. Uh, Nadine, have you been? Yes, it's awesome. I recommend it. It's really fun. It's great. It's just amazing. Yeah. I'm loving all these shameless plugs. This is, uh, you know, <laughs> if, I, if I could tick off how many shameless plugs I got here, that's, uh, that's good stuff on my end. <laughs> I feel like you guys have given very good information for our audience today. I feel like it's been a good discussion. I've learned some things, which I always appreciate. I finally um, learned what attrition was. <laughs> right? You know, sometimes Brent and I have done a number of shows together over the years um, and have had many conversations. And I think both of us always forget what the other person doesn't know um, <laughs> and they're surprised by. And it's great because we do, you know, we have a vast and interesting industry that has so many facets that are part of it. Um, and I think that housing really is, to me, it's the, it's the baseline. You know, it's like, it's the you have to get it right. Um, and you have to get it right for so many reasons, you know, because that's what gets people there. That's what grows conferences, as you pointed out, Jeff, with those larger, you know, looking at different mixes of housing. Um, you know, it's about, like, I, I can't believe, Nadine, that you have people who really choose destinations without actually thinking of hotels. But then when I think about my own career, yes, people have done that. And it's just, it's stunning <laughs> to me because it's, it's, it's so important and it's important on all of the things that you talked about, you know, the serendipitous meetings because you're in the same hotel as your primary tribe, which might be, a, you know, a host hotel or one of a number of host hotels if your conference is large. Or as you said, if you're in Europe and you're using a conference center and a number of hotels, you know, you have those opportunities the conversations that happen both inside and because of outs and then outside of the conference proper are what make events special. Um, that idea for that face-to-face, -face, that tribe building is really important. So if you could each pick one thing that you would say to meeting and event planners, one tip, what would your one great tip be? Ladies first, Jeff first. We'll go Jeff first. All right. No, I, 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 <laughs> I, uh, I would say my one tip at this point in time is don't be rash in how you modify your business and your behavior on the back of this uh, change in commission payments from Marriott. I think it's very important to keep your eyes open and get your wheels turning on what, wh where you might be able to pivot and some ideas and suggestions around if this, then that. So if, if other uh, hotels follow suit, this is the direction and path that I might take. If others go the other direction, this is the path that I'll follow and take. Um, but really just to hang tight, breathe, be calm, 
and just wait to see how it plays out over the, over the course of the next uh, several months. Yeah, that's great advice. Nadine, what's one thing that, one great tip? Yeah, I think what Jeff said is really good in line with this is also for making considerations on what do you want to see and how can you, your decisions align with that. If you see hotels that give you 10% or 12%, is there a way that you can funnel your business there? And to show through where you spend your money on what you want to grow, see grow and see more off. Yeah, definitely, right? Always tying it back to ultimately what your business goals are, I think, super key. Um, and any one last question, um, which we ask everybody, because it's super important, because you guys are the people who are the icons in the know. Um, a co any great, you know, one or two cool resources, websites, blogs, books that you just think everybody should know about? Uh, well, I'll take that one. The first, I would say if, if housing and accommodation management is kind of your um, forte or something that, that you have interest in, uh, we have an ebook on housing that's uh, downloadable off of our website. So meetingmax.cc is the website address. And uh, you can download the, the, the ebook on housing, which gives you uh, a lot of uh, statistics and tips and tricks and um, general understanding of housing. Uh, on a non-industry related, I would say uh, my favorite book that I would uh, highly recommend is a book called Leadership and Self-Deception, uh, which uh, has uh, been a big, and you talk about us building a culture as, uh, as, as an organization at Meeting Max, Leadership and Self-Deception is really one of the uh, central philosophies around the culture that we've been able to build at Meeting Max. So those are my two takeaways. Excellent. Nadine, close it out. Um, the magazine con from PCMA is really good. There's lots of great yeah. articles in there. Yeah, I think that's a great resource. And any book that really inspires you and that opens up big thoughts, like the book that Jeff suggested, any kind of books in this area where you just open up your mind and think outside of your traditional ways of thinking will invite in other ideas in other areas of your life, be it at home or at work. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, Brant. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, we want to make sure that we say thank you so much for you guys for joining us. Jeff Duncan, CEO of Meeting Max. Where can people find out more about what you're up to these days? Uh, I think a lot of, um, if you go to the meetingmax.cc website, and I think there's uh, links back to blog posts, uh, you can certainly connect with me on LinkedIn uh, and uh, follow a lot of uh, articles that I publish and uh, various speaking engagements that I'm, uh, that I'm a party to. All right. Thank you very much for joining us. And Nadine Spätler, take a shot yes. at it. All awesome. right. <laughs> Good All right. well done. <laughs> <laughs> I've been getting a lot of the European names lately on this show. Where can people find out more about you? Well, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm in Vancouver. We have a great pink couch here in the office. Come and visit us for <laughs> some coffee and we'll organize cake in a delicious local bakery. Yeah, so <laughs> awesome. nice. I love to Wonderful. see you. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us as well. Just a reminder that Event Icons is recorded live each Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you can watch behind the scenes each week uh, joining us on Facebook Live. Uh, it's released, however, the following Tuesday on iTunes, Pocket Cast, Stitcher, or wherever you find your favorite podcast app. Uh, but most importantly, it's released on the Endless blog at Endless Events, event-icons.com. Event -icons That's the best way. Uh, for you to join us. You can sign up there to join the chat live, just like our friend Devin did today, uh, along with the other people that were just lurking in, soaking up the knowledge uh, that joined us today. So be sure and sign up there and you can join us live as we record and ask questions live of the Advent icons uh, there on Zoom. We want to know what you think. Give us a shout out on Twitter, on Facebook. Use the hashtag event icons. Let us know who you want to see on the show, what you thought of today's show, whether or not the commission structure is going to impact you and your world, uh, or maybe that's just not that big of a deal, but it gives people something to write about. Um, so let us know how, if it's going to impact your world as things move forward. Thank you so much for joining us on Event Icons, and we'll see you next week. Thank you, guys. Woo! 
Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the social conversation. Sponsored by Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with hashtag event icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on hashtag event icons. Or 2 p.m. in Vancouver. <laughs> yes.